Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome, yeah, to this webinar today on biohazards and understanding them really in terms of the pest controller role. Um, before I get started, just a few housekeeping bits. So I'm getting a few hellos popping up. So I'm, I'm assuming everybody can hear and see me okay. So that's fantastic. If we do have any technical problems, my colleague Lauren Day is sat there just um, at the side of me keeping an eye on things. And again, if any, if I suddenly disappear, which hopefully won't happen, Lauren will pop up and just guide everybody. And also if you, if you guys think you're experiencing some um, sound problems or, or visual problems, and again, put Put your comments in the chat section. So, um, so I'm coming on to explain the housekeeping bit. If you've got te technical problems with the video or the sound, or you just want to have a chat amongst yourself, or you've got some just comments to make rather than questions, then you can use the chat function down at the bottom. Um, I think a lot of you are, are probably quite familiar with these webinars. Some of you may be brand new, um, but for you that those that are brand new or you just need your jog in your memory, chat section for technical problems and just some general chat. If you've got any questions for me um, in terms of the presentation and the content, then there's a Q&A button that you'll see, bottom screen, side screen, depending on what uh, device you're using. So make sure you click on that if you've got a question for me. I'll be doing the questions at the end. I'm not going to stop halfway through. I did do that for a while, but I think it works better if I throw, flow through that presentation and then we can have questions at the end and, and hopefully we'll have a good 10, 15, 20 minutes maybe. Um, so that's with that. I can't hear or see you, of course. Um, so again, uh, any questions or any information you need, chat section or Q&A section. Um, CPD points, uh, as we all know, it's one CPD point for each technical hour that we do with training. Um, so yeah, you get one of those today when you registered, whether you're the sort of BBCA registered scheme or basis prompt, you would have provided your, your details with us. So we'll automatically, um, upload that for you. You can watch this presentation again afterwards. If you find me that interesting and this, this, uh, webinar that great and you want to share it as well with other people, then please do. Um, it'll be on our website under old webinars, go and have a nose, but if you can't find it, just get in touch and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction. Um, so yeah, that's about that with that. In terms of this today then, so biohazards and, and understanding them. Now, um, I'm just going to go on to the next group. I'm going to share my screen quickly so you can all get rid of my face for a minute. Um, Agenda wise, I'll press the button. Let's just see if it works quickly for me. Do, do, do. It's a bit slow today. So anyway, uh, the agenda screen will pop up in a moment. But in terms of what we're going to cover, so I've got a bit of a you know disclaimer alert. I'm not an expert on biological hazards. I've never studied them. I'm not a, a lab technician or a scientist that um, knows the details and the history and the um, um, you know, sort of scientific background to the biohazards we're going to talk about. Of course, I've got the knowledge that I need. And that's what I want to share with you. You know, what, what knowledge do you need to have as a technician, as a manager, a supervisor, business owner? Um, and what do you need to look for? And then what do you need to do to, um, you know, mitigate your risk? So I'm going to attempt again to get onto my agenda item. There we go. Lauren hasn't popped up yet saying there's any problems and I don't think anybody else is saying there's any issues um, with the presentation. Let me just have a look in the chat section because I want to make sure you guys are, are happy and you can see everything. Yeah, I think we are. Good to go. Um, so as I said, you know, um, disclaimer alert, I'm, you know, biohazards we will touch on them and we will talk about them and by by all means ask ask questions about the specific hazards and i'll do my best you know as i said i've got some you know knowledge that hopefully i can share with you and and give you what you need but i'm no scientist by any stretch of the imagination um we'll talk about the legal requirements what you need to do and mitigating the risk which of course is the most important bits as well you know understanding those biological hazards and then making sure they don't become a problem um, I mean, you know, this 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 presentation, as I said, it's it's for it's for everyone. And just want to make one note. I've been doing these webinars for two years, and we always get quite good numbers. Now today we've got 177 of you tuned in, and you guys are the most motivated people in the industry to log on to a webinar halfway through your day 
um, you know, watch the content, learn some bits, asking questions. Cause you do, you always ask questions. I've always got stuff that I can't get to at the end and you, you do engage and, um, it really impresses the BPCA that you do this. So we want to say, you know, a big well done to you and that you, you just log in on today is, is a commitment. It's, it's, it's a, you're showing that commitment you have to making sure you keep up to date, um, you know, watching these webinars. Apart from, I can see you put your phone down. And make sure you watch the webinar, okay? I can see you. All right, there we go. Thank you. What? Okay, great. Let's get on with it. So, yeah, biological hazards. Let's have a look at what we need to know. It seems to be a bit slow today, so apologies if I'm talking and a slide is not coming up. Um, so, there we go. Blimey. I'm quicker than the slides today. That's unusual. So, biological hazards. Um, they are, in basic terms, they threat, they're, they're a threat to the, so the living organism. So let me start again. Biological substances, they pose a threat to the health of living organisms. So of course, in this case, it's us. Um, they're also known as biohazards. So that's um, um, a shortened version rather than biological hazards. You might hear the term biohazards quite a lot. Um, and again, it's, it's substances that pose a threat to the health of living organisms, and primarily humans. This can include things like uh, medical waste or samples of microorganisms, viruses, toxins. You know, as you can see here, I've got a, I've got a list of things. Um, and the ones highlighted in yellow are the ones that I have identified as probably the most likely biohazards that you may come in contact or the things that you need to be aware of where you could um, get yourself in a, a bit of deep water in terms of um, biohazards and contracting a virus or um, and bacteria. And uh, But basically, it's any risk that comes from the biosphere. So people, plants and animals. I mean, that, that word bio, you know, biosphere, biological, it's, it's living organisms that you can um, consider as biological hazards. You know, stinging insects, you know, that, that's a big thing for us, isn't it? We, um, you know, whether it's wasps nests or, you know, you're advising customers on, you know, bee removal or conservation and you're, you're standing around these things, you, there's always a chance of stinging. And even if you're not dealing with uh, a wasp nest or um, bees of any description, you know, just being out and about, certainly so during the summer months, you're rooting around gardens, rooting around bushes on industrial estates or whatever it is you might do. Um, you can still come into, into contact with these stinging insects. You know, if you've, if you've got a technician that, um, or, or yourself that's particularly sensitive to the venom of a bee sting, um, then, you know, simply just taking them off of certain work that might include doing wasp nests might not actually be enough. You know, you might, you might, you still need to consider the fact that they're out and about, you know, and in summer months, they're, they're still going to be coming into contact with the, the rooting around we do. Um, and of course, where nests could and possibly be. Um, animal and bird droppings, you know, we'll, we'll go into a bit more about the specifics of what can come from these things. This is just thinking about the areas. So, um, you know, mold and fungi. So if you're working in, um, you know, domestic premises where maybe the, the landlord hasn't taken much care, um, you know, these molds and fungi can certainly cause problems. Probably, probably less con concern for us. You know, it's not something um, we, we would come into contact so much. Um, you might notice it in a building and you wouldn't necessarily come into contact with it. And, you know, but then again, working in basements, um, working at sort of subterrain levels, um, and certainly possibly you could, you know, come into contact with that. So it's worth thinking about, okay? Um, obviously sewage um, in sewers, okay? We don't necessarily climb into these sewers. Um, you know, possibly some specialised companies do, but, you know, certainly we'll be lifting those those lids, whether it's a, um, a public sewer or a private sewer, you know, looking for rat activity. And of course, you've still got those hazards that could be um, around. You know, as we've seen before, sewers can overflow sometimes and that, that waste comes out the top. And then, of course, you know, everything in and around that lid and the, the top of the sewer where maybe is the limitation of where we're looking or seeing or touching, um, it can still be contaminated. So I've um, got to think about it. Um, and again, plants, you know, um, you know, whether it's stinging nettles, it might be, uh, you know, thorns and things like that. And again, we, we, we root around these things, don't we? If we've got, you know, rat activity outside or we've got, you know, wasps nests, things like that, we're, we certainly could come into, con you know, harmful plants that could cause a, a biohazard to us. So, you know, you might not need complicated mitigation measures, but it's still worth thinking about. And, you know, 
in terms of this sit down, I'm going to go into this a bit more later with the mitigation measures, but you know, if you're, if you're as a manager, a supervisor, a technician, company owner, and you think, oh, I've got to think of these biohazards. I've got to, I've got to sit here and think about what biohazards we might come across so that we can do our mitigation measures. You know, why sit there on your own and do it? Why don't you get everybody together? You know, get the technicians, you know, get the other management teams. If it's just yourself, maybe speak to the BPCA or speak to a friend or a colleague and go, oh, you know, I'm just trying to think outside the box here and what problems I could come across. You know, what, what sort of sites do I go on? What sort of um, places do I visit? What sort of things do I route around? What could I come into contact with? Um, now, uh, you know, I've, I've greyed out the blood and body fluids because it's possibly not as common a issue. Um, again, if you guys want to put, you know, comments in the Q&As that you definitely want me to see and read out that might be, you know, really interesting to everybody, please put that in there. But blood and body fluids are generally a little less common that we come across. However, of course, you know, we've got things like needle pricks. Um, you know, if you're working in... Um, you know, uh, uh, central city um, homeless shelter or, or hostel or somewhere um, that's, you know, got particularly bad ones of rats or mice and things like that. And you're, you're rooting around and there's a potential for or coming into contact with with needles. Um, then, of course, you know, you've got some, you know, lots of different problems, there, hepatitis B and even HIV, if it's a used needle that's been discarded uh, improperly, but also um, purposefully. Um, it, you know, they can be taped underneath railings, for example, down blocks of flats. I don't know if anybody, hopefully nobody here has experienced that. And I hope nobody in the industry has experienced that. But it does happen um, where needles can be purposefully placed or strapped to a certain area because they want to cause harm to somebody else. Um, it happens. Uh, you know, fortunately, not too often, and we're generally cautious. So again, these things you've got to think about, haven't we? Um, and airborne pathogens. Now, you put the common cold in there, you might have noticed, um, haven't specifically mentioned COVID-19. Um, we do have a presentation specifically on that that we done this time last year, almost exactly, I think. Um, and, you know, I'm not here to talk about COVID-19 specifically, but that would be um, a biohazard. You know, it's um, it, it's it's a threat to the health of living organisms, and it's from you know an animal. Again, debates about that, but these things um, can be passed from animal to animal. You know, transmission. So, yeah, that's something to consider as well. And I'm sure you've got your own risk assessments on that. All right. So yeah, that, that's what a biohazard is. Um, anything that's threat to the health of living organisms, and also you know, in terms of where it comes from, it's the biosphere, it's the, the, the earth around us, the atmosphere around us, the people, plants and animals, the living things within that biosphere. OK, anything that could be contracted. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, good. OK, so the examples then talk about zoonosis. Um, of course, that is a factor as well. Um, wasn't heavily gone into on the other slide, mentioned about birds and bird droppings, etc. But um, there's a few more other things that we can think about. Um, so salmonella, we salmonellosis, we've all heard of that. It's a symptomatic infection caused by bacteria of the salmonella type. Um, the most common symptoms are you know, diarrhea, fever, abnormal cramps, it's sort of flu-like. A lot of these things, the symptoms are actually flu-like. So if you ever have a technician or your technician yourself or manager supervisor and you have flu symptoms it could be a multitude of things um of course it, it could be the flu um it could be a bad cold um it could be a you know you worked too hard at the gym the day before um but certainly a lot of these um zoonosis that mentioned here the flu like symptoms is a very common first kind of um uh, uh symptom to look for um, and they usually occur within 12 hours to 36 hours after exposure and last for about seven days in terms of cellular. Now, in terms of that uh, contraction, we know, you know, it's, it's surfaces, it's, you know, if it's cockroaches or it might be rats, you know, that physical moving around the environment and, and, and walking over surfaces, you know, if rats have been in sewers or, you know, these cockroaches might've been in sewers, they might've been in unsanitary areas and then they're walking across surfaces. Obviously your customers are at risk for these things. Um, but, you know, also yourself. 
So again, I'll go into a bit later about those mitigation measures and and what you can do to prevent it. But um, it certainly is something to, to to consider. You know, not just for work. You know, in your personal life, we've got to be careful, haven't we? Um, so antivirus infection. I'm not sure how many of you might have heard of this. I remember at an event about four or five years ago, they first started talking about it and, and they were referring specifically to, to mice um, carrying it. But each antivirus is specific to a different rodent host. So this is a general overview. Um, and once infected, the rodent will secrete infections, um, virus for prolonged periods, so probably for life. If a mouse has got that infection or rat, um, they will they'll probably secrete it for, for, for life or for a very long time anyway. Um, transmission of the virus is usually in humans. It occurs through inhalation of the infected animal, uh, excretia, uh, fluids such as urine, feces, saliva, the normal stuff that we don't want to be touching, do we? You know, we know that. Um, it's just good to know the reasons why and understand why and be able to, you know, make sure you guys that are out there, if it's you that's out there, you know, your business, you're, you're thinking about these things and you're making specific decisions to mitigate those risks. OK, um, so Q fever, again, quite a quite a brand new one. As it mentions down the bottom left hand corner of this slide, PPC 101, um, we had an article and this has come from that article. So if you want to read a bit more about these um, zoonosis then again, I'm, I'm going to be covering it briefly, but certainly that magazine goes into more detail um, and, uh, and yeah, be good, good information for you and some more CBD points. But Q fever or query fever um, is a disease caused um, infection with Coxiella brunitae. It's a bacterium that affects humans and other animals. Um, it's, it's quite uncommon, but usually it's, but many are found in sort of cattle and sheep and goats and also possibly domestic animals, including cats and dogs. So, you know, animals generally, you know, they need to, you know, that infection, you might think it's unlikely or, um, you know, coming into contact, you know, of course, cats and dogs, we work in domestic premises, premises probably, or in, on farms where they have these animals. Um, so, you know, generally you've got to put in measures to make sure that we mitigate the risks come into contact with these. But yeah, Q, Q fever, it's... Um, a pretty pretty new one to us. Um, leptospirosis. So you know, a lot of us. This is the main one that we're all really familiar with. And if anyone ever asks you about zoonosis, we we, we normally come to leptospirosis. And it's a blood infection caused by the bacteria Leptospira. Um, jaundice is a following um, name that comes along with it because the signs and symptoms can range from mild headaches, muscle pains, fevers, um, but viral disease. So salmonella leptospirosis, sorry, is the, you know, the 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 the, the virus, the start of the virus, the, the 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 chain that will then turn into Vals disease, the more acute, severe form of leptospirosis. So they are slightly different, but generally, you know, Vals disease is the more severe form of this leptospirosis um, and causes the infected infected individual. Ugh, get my words out, causes the infected individual to become um, jaundice. So hence the name leptospirosis jaundice. It can cause, you know, develop kidney kidney failure and bleeding. Usually the skin and eyes become sort of yellowish. I've actually seen somebody with the condition, actually not with Viles disease, but certainly a kidney disease, uh, disease and it's, it does, it cause a, a real yellowing and um, actually, yeah, flagged it up to them uh, one day and yeah. Um, glad I did really because you know but it's a good sign it's it, you know if you if you see anyone starting to yellow it's, I say a bit too late it's not and get treatment but we want to really catch it before then so again we can you know the flu symptoms side of things if, it, if at any time anybody is getting flu symptoms um, you know during I say during the course of their work at any point you know it's important that we are aware of the the, the possible things that we might have come into contact recently and then by knowing these um, or remember these different zoonoses, we might be able to um, you know, tell our doctor a bit more information. They can do the certain tests and find it. I do know there was one person I worked with that had Viles disease. We, we used to, the company I worked for years ago, um, they used to do regular blood tests for us. So once a year, we'd, we'd go to the doctors and have a blood test and they'd test different things. Um, and, and Viles disease or leptospirosis was one of them. And yeah, one year, one of the guys come back um, as, as having it. It was its early stages. It was a course of antibiotics. It was pretty straightforward. Um, but yeah, it, it, it served as a form of that, that blood test. You know, if they hadn't have done that, 
um, it would have progressed and maybe caused more problems. So but that's kind of a mitigation measure. I'll go into a bit more with that later on. Um, so, yes, yeah, cystocosis, the, so ornithosis is another name for it. That's, again, how it starts out in the bird and how it um, lays within the board, bird. And then when it's cystocosis is normally when it you know, comes into contact with us and causes us a problem. Um, it's an infection in the birds. It's caused um, by the bacterium. Uh, the disease has been described in many species of birds. So more particularly like parrots, parakeets. I know parakeets are becoming um, quite a bit more common um in terms of you know certainly london or southeast i know uh, I mean, i'm up in yorkshire now but I, I used to work in london and the southeast and i left there about 12 years ago 13 years ago and i remember them becoming a thing then i remember people talking about them but i never actually dealt with them personally myself so um and i'm sure lots of you here do come across them or do have phone calls about them sometimes and yeah they, they really can cause some problems i hear you know the noise you know the flocking of them and once they get into a reef space which i had recently it's uh pretty destructive so yeah tricky but we're not here to talk about parakeets are we but they can have or, or carry this uh cystocosis. so um other, of course, other common birds do include pigeons and doves. So important for anybody that, you know, deals with um, pigeons or any birds when we're, you know, dealing with their droppings. Um, so normally where cystocosis will occur um, is from the, the dry spores from the dropping. So if you've got, um, you know, uh, an attic space or um, an abandoned warehouse, for example, that's got a lot of drop-ins that you need to clear up. Um, you'll probably know it's quite common practice to wet those drop-ins or at least use a bias side. Um, and that wetting of them prevents those spores from um, kind of uh, 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 dusting up into the atmosphere and then breathing them in. It, it reduces that risk. Now, the interesting thing about that is that's a... Um, uh, technical control point in terms of risk assessment. It's really exciting stuff. Um, I'll come on to that in a moment. Again, I won't talk too much about the mitigation measures again because I get ahead of myself a bit and confuse everybody. So, um, but yeah, in terms of wetting that, um, those droppings downs can reduce those spores that will be actively moving in the environment and then possibly causing a, um, a hazard to the one clearing it up. I've done that many times. I found myself in many uh, abandoned warehouses clearing out what was left behind from a large pigeon infestation. Uh, so be wary of that. <clears throat> and then another one, so tax, uh, toxoplasmosis. It's a common infection that you can catch from basically the, the feces of infected cats um, or infected meat. Uh, it's usually harmless, but can cause serious problems in some people. You know, um, you know, it doesn't usually cause any symptoms. Now, this is one that doesn't usually cause many symptoms. And most people don't realize they've had it. Um, you know, some people get sort of flu-like symptoms, possibly, um, but sometimes you don't. Now, again, it's about avoiding. Um, and if there's if you if you suspect or you know, you you know there's you've been around a cat or some meat that has been confirmed that there's um toxoplasmosis within them, then again, maybe get, get yourself tested just, just to be safe. Um, but yeah, cats and 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 meats, raw meats, that's um, or infected meats. That's what you've got to look out for. Um, right, okay. Am I going to attempt to say this one? I always struggle with this one. So, cryptosporidiasis. Done all right, didn't I? Yeah. Don't comment whether I did all right. But anyway, you can see it on there. It's a diarrheal um, disease caused by a microscopic parasite. They're all pretty, you know, microscopic. Um, it can live in the intestine of humans and animals and is passed on in, in stool feces um, of the infected person or animal. Again, that animal to animal person, you know, human to animal um, transmission, that biohazard. Um, so, yeah, the parasite commonly known as crypto might have heard of that as well. Um, then yeah, again, just really important to, you know, be aware of these things, do a bit more research into it. As I said, I'm not, you know, um, I'm not a lab technician or, a, you know, I don't, I don't do detailed research into these specific zoonoses or the, or the other um, infections we might talk about in a bit, but you know, be aware of them and, you know, consider them and, you know, a lot of it's common sense in terms of how you're going to mitigate it. Okay. Um, so it's lone working. This is, this is important. So these zoonosis, biological biohazards, let's call them as the group as they are, um, you know, lone working does make you very vulnerable to biological 
um, or biohazards um, because, you know, you may not be able to seek help as quickly or as easily as if you were, of course, with somebody or you're working in an office. Um, additionally, some biological hazards are hard to identify. So if the employee is working outside, there is an added risk to, for exposure to biological hazards. Again, wastings. You know, if we're working out and about um, and it's not you don't even have to be, you know, doing a wasp nest. Um, I think <laughs> I think the three or four times I've been stung in my career, I think only once, maybe twice was when I was actually dealing with a wasp nest. The other times it's just, you know, me sitting on one or, you know, one getting in my van when I was set at the traffic lights or <laughs> so it can happen. You know, don't just sort of assume, oh, I'll take that person off of that work and it won't be a problem anymore. Not necessarily. Um, <clears throat> but yes, yeah, so the example of a worker who's allergic to bee stings may experience severe allergic reactions, so anaphylactic shock. Um, again, th this is all your, you know, this is more about your induction with employees and your, you know, yearly minimum kind of um, uh, health surveillance, if you like. You know, ask these questions like, is there anything you're concerned about? Do you know of any um, any change in your um, um, uh, what's the word allergic reactions because because this is the thing with with wastings we, we we assume that if you get stung lots you'll become or you'll start to get a tolerance to it if even if you know you did have a, a bad reaction to it the more you're stung you might get a tolerance to it but that's not not the case with bee stings it's uh, or wastings it's actually the opposite the more you get stung possibly the more vulnerable you could be um so no pun intended um so, yeah, we need we need to consider that and, and ask, you know, your technicians and ask yourself, you know, sort of an internal monologue of, uh, you know, am I any more sensitive? When was the last time I was stung? Do I know if I'm sensitive or not? We're not sure. Again, you know, ask these questions um, and, and and get a good view of, of, of what you what yourself and your staff and what what sensitivities there might be. Um, you know, in situations of lone work, in monitoring systems can help um, employee raise the alarms, you know, having a process in place, certainly. Um, you know, biological hazards are, are, are elusive, really. They can appear and then disappear in a short period of time. So, again, it's important to know how to recognise and prepare for them, um, you know, kind of make the assumption that, you know, um, worst case scenario, possibly. You know, we don't like to think, you know, cup is half empty or half full and all this. But when it comes to work, you've got to keep people safe. So, you know, think about worst case scenario. That's my my um, my uh, advice. OK, so loan work. Think about that. Um, so the law are quite straightforward, really, um, as with most things in, in uh, uh, any industry you know, throughout the whole of the UK. The Health and Safety at Work Act is the. Um, most important bit of legislation and specifically COSH, so the control of substances hazardous to health. Now, you know, if you ever look up prosecutions under COSH, normally they they won't they'll they'll refer to COSH as you know it was not followed or the the regulations were not followed. Um, however, the prosecution will normally happen under the Health and Safety at Work Act. You know, under you know depending on what the problem was, but they'll use that. Um, that that act that bit of legislation as a prosecution tool, but they'll use the COSH legislation as the well, COSH regulations say you should have been doing all these things to protect your staff from biohazards, and we can't see you were, so um, we're going to get you. So that's the you know we're all familiar with COSH. Again, this is not a COSH lesson, but again, the Control of Substances has the health regulations, um, 2002. Yeah, no one correct if I'm I'm not wrong. Um, you know, so yeah, and it's really to do with occupational risk for pest management professionals. So in our work, of course, we, you know, our occupational risks are going to be different to maybe some colleagues that are, you know, working in the office and dealing with accounts or, or um, you know, sort of operations management. You know, they're, they're very different. So we've got to remember that. Um, again, you know, like I mentioned with COSH, microorganisms are covered in this. So COSH is not just about, you know, your... Um, pyrethroids or your carbon mates or your you know fumigation products or whatever it might be um it's also about you know biological biohazards the control of substances hazardous to health it doesn't say the control of chemicals or pesticides hazardous to health you know it's substances hazardous to health and that includes biological so again you know extra reading the hsc website certainly has has all these things for you to do extra reading on 
I'm just keeping an eye on the time there for you guys. Um, yeah. Okay. So risk assessments. Let's have a look at mitigation measures. Okay. I'm going to get you guys involved in something in a minute. I think I've got some time for it. Um, I just, you know, in the chat section, but I'll, I'll go on to it in a minute. Just before I do, um, it'd be the slide after this. So mitigating the risks of hazards. Mitigating basically means preventing, of course, or at least um, making it less likely that this hazard is going to become a problem or somebody's going to get infected with it. Straightforward. Um, once that biological hazards have been identified, it's important that you put together a safety plan to mitigate these risks and do a risk assessment on the biohazards. Um, really important you do that. Now, again, this isn't a risk assessment webinar. Um, we've got one of them. Them. So go and have a look by all means. And again, that can guide you through how to put together your risk assessment for biological hazards. But all you've got to do really is, you know, figure out what the risk is, figure out or figure out what the hazard is, because um, hazard is the thing that causes the problem. So let's take Viles disease, for example. Go right, Viles disease, let's address that in my line on my risk assessment. Okay, right. Can we eliminate that risk? Can we get rid of it completely? Answer is probably no, isn't it? Because, you know, those rats are out there. Those rats have got that leptospirosis in their urine tract that they're emitting everywhere. Can't really get rid of it, can we? So we can't eliminate that risk. So then the next step would be to reduce and control the risk. So, right, what can I do with my employee or myself to make sure that that risk I can't eliminate is less likely to be a problem? Or, you know, I'm going to control the, the procedures that we have and reduce the risks of a technician or myself coming into contact with it. Okay, we'll look at that more specifically in a moment. And then the really last option. Um, so this is a this is the hierarchy of a risk management kind of you know simplified a little bit because again I don't want to do a, a webinar on risk assessing. Um, but the last bit is PPE. You know, PPE. I think we all know that PPE is the last resort, isn't it? I said PPE a lot then, didn't I? I won't say it again. Um, it's the last resort we shouldn't just automatically go you know for the gloves and the masks and the overalls i mean possibly you are doing that because there's been a risk assessment that's been done you're doing other things to reduce your likeliness like staying away from things or um you know burying it off or whatever it is that you're doing but you might also need a little bit of uh ppe I said it again um so you know this last risk so eliminate that risk control it if you can't eliminate it reduce the risk of you coming in contact with it. And then last option is to go, right, what PPE do we, we have to have? Because in some situations, you can't maybe do any of the above. You know, you can't eliminate it, can't necessarily control it. You can't control where the rodents go until you get in there and maybe do some proofing and, and you know, uh, pest control and get rid of those rats. Um, you know, that first contact with that area is going to be there possibly. So what about reducing the risk? Okay. Um, you know, maybe um, the, 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 the contact we have with the area is kept to a minimum, but where we need to contact with the area, we wear PPE. So, you know, gloves and things like that. OK, so, yeah, really, it's really straightforward. It's not, you know, the, the, maybe the title of this presentation, um, biological hazards and, you know, understanding them. Um, you know, I might have thought, oh, blimey, that might be a complicated or... Um, you know, particularly technical in terms of biological substances webinar. But no, you know, it's just about identifying what they are, what affects you and how you can make sure you don't come into contact with it. Straightforward, really, isn't it? Um, so um, I am going to ask you guys, we've got a bit of time. Uh, I haven't got that many slides left. So some examples to consider. Um, Use the chat section. So, again, you know, you don't have to get involved. I'm not going to be, you know, I haven't got a list of all of you here and checking you off that you're all getting involved, you know. Um, but have a have a think about this. So I've got three examples here, a farm, a shelter for the homeless, and a domestic home, so a house, suburban. Uh, the farm is obviously rural, and the shelter for the homeless is urban, so a city, city environment, a built-up environment. I just want you to, again, you know, you can see on there what I'm asking, what biohazards um, do we have? I meant to put, do we have? I was a bit of a test for you to see if you'd tell me I'd done that wrong, but what biohazards do we have um, on each of these sites? So, you know, 
you don't all have to address all the sites, you know, but if you can think of um, things that you get on a farm, what, what biohazards might there be on a farm? What biohazards might there be in a, a shelter for the homeless? Um, you know, 200 rooms. So it's pretty large, you know, I've given a little bit of detail there. And and what biohazards might we have a domestic home? You know, if you put some answers on there, just put, you know, if you if you're answering the farm one, put farm and then your answer, or if it's for the a shelter, put shelter and the answer and domestic, domestic and the answer. Just to get you guys thinking a bit more, um, you know, about site specific, because this is what it is. You I'll go on in a moment about risk assessments and the types that you have to do, but um surely, you know, it's not just about looking at biohazards in what you might come across that's important and again mention it later it's important to do it generically but you know site specifically is going to be more useful to that technician because these three examples here are pretty different aren't they and the biohazard you might come across will be different as well um i've got a few comments coming in i'm gonna try and get my arrow over there here we go all right chat section Oh, blimey. Yeah, you guys are getting in there. Nice one. So rural. Um, again, I'm going to say your first names. You don't mind. You know, you haven't been anonymous. So, uh, um, you know, these are all great things here. So Martin, rural, insect stinging. Yeah, absolutely. Animal diseases, both from stock and wildlife. Absolutely. Animals. That's it. It's, um, you know, you guys were listening to what I was saying before, you know, the animals all sorts of things, probably some things I haven't even mentioned. You know, again, I'm not a, I'm not a vet. I don't study these things, you know, but stay away from them. You know, these animals can cause, uh, cause some, some problems. I say that, you know, we can cause as many problems. Of course we can, us humans, we're, uh, uh, yeah, um, cause some issues, but of course, you know, is what it is. Uh, so fecal waste in all of them. Yeah. So fecal waste. Absolutely. If you've got a domestic home, you're dealing with rats in, in the attic, you'll be like, Oh, wait a minute, I'm going to go and have a look at the drains because, uh, got some rats up in this attic and they're probably coming from the drain so i'm going to lift that up absolutely farm and cattle you know whether it's human waste or whether it's cattle or farm you know animal waste absolutely and and of course in in depends what you're doing in the shelter for homeless in the urban area it could be you know again dealing with drains or it might be cockroaches and you might be checking some drains might be some i don't know blocked something that's overflowed and caused some sort of issue you know all sorts of things so yeah 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 absolutely um shelter needles body fluids absolutely that's why i put that one in there cliff it is a you know a, a personal a personal experience i had as well what I used to work in a center of uh, uh london i won't mention where but um, I keep probably 400 rooms, it might not even 200 rooms, but there were some particular special hazards there, you know, talking health and safety generally, you know, um, sort of violence and things like that, um, that, that I was at risk of, but also the, the needles, um, and a lot of sites, they, so these shelters, sometimes they have arrangements in place that they, they would rather, um, people use drugs in a safe manner rather than getting dirty needles, new needles and using them over and over again. Some of them will arrange for clean needles to be delivered every day, which are available to the residents just so that they know they're being safe in terms of, you know, um, sharing needles and, and things like that. So they have a disposal area, but of course, you know, not everybody is going to stick to it in those shelters and they just throw them out their window or they might stick them in the stairwell possibly of, of, uh, of the block that you're wandering a down and, you know, you put your hand on the rail and you're wandering and, you know, you get a, a needle prick, which is, has happened. Um, you know, again, it's malicious, um, but it, 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 you've got to, got to think of these things. It might be you're in the bushes outside, you know, rooting around trying to find some uh, rat activity or, or some, maybe so you're looking for broken vents that might have appeared and you're sort of putting some bushes back to try and have a look. You know, again, you've got to think about what could be in those bushes and certainly needles cliff, absolutely. Um, yeah, farm disease, absolutely. Um, animal transport, Susan, yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, this isn't as much a biohazard, but the animal themselves, I mean, I'll give you all a secret. I'm scared of cattle. I don't like cows. They scare me, um, especially when they're in a field and I'm out walking my dog and I come across them. I will do anything to avoid them. I'll like climb over a fence and shimmy across something just to avoid them, petrified of them. But they are, you know, joking aside, they are very hazardous. Um, you've got to stay, you know, got to stay away from them. I think I was looking at an HSE report and um, 
it's exciting stuff I do. Um, and they're, yeah, deaths, farmers, you know, in terms of deaths and numbers of deaths through farming, um, you know, top of the list, or not top of the list, but certainly the top three was, you know, death by um, by the animal themselves. So, you know, uh, crushing and squashing and, um, yeah, all sorts of nasty things. So, um, but that's that's kind of aside from the bio, the bio um a biohazard side of things but still something to think about yeah on the farm you've got cats yeah absolutely you know uh, rat urine feces you know the boxes that we might have around that we're managing or the the hard bridges that we're, we're we're treating again we're rooting around these places and you've got to think you know disposable gloves are, are not suitable for things like that yes they you know if you're rooting around things if you get a tear in that glove then it's completely useless um you know and certainly you know using insecticides or pesticides you know you've got to have some sturdy um a particular gauge to gloves i can't the, the number now um but you know not disposable sort of rubber <clears throat> sorry latex gloves um other um uh formulations if you like available because i know latex can cause obviously problems for skin um home shelter yet yeah, needles excess refuse body spillages Absolutely. There could, could be anything really, couldn't there? So again, it's, you know, these things it's good to sit down with. If you've got, you know, all these sites and there's four or five of you, 50 of you, a hundred of you that work within an organization and you think, I just can't think, my, you know, my brain's gone dead. I can't think of what biohazards we have. Get together, sit down because, you know, I'm using you guys right now. You're giving me some great ideas. You know, I've thought of a few, few things, but um, when you've got more people on the job, um, thinking about what those hazards might be, it's going to be a lot easier and, you know, you're going to cover more things and come up with more ideas. But yeah, Lucy, absolutely. Um, excess refuse would, would be one that I haven't mentioned. You, you don't know what you could have in amongst that, have all sorts of things. You know, if you're on a domestic site, it could be nappies and things like that. If they've spilled open or, you know, you might go and move a, 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 a rubbish bag somewhere and it might spill open. I mean, yes, the likeness of these things, you might think, not like Natalie. Okay. Well, you know, you reflect that in your risk assessment. You know, there's a low risk of this, but there's a little risk. So let's let's talk about it. Let's make sure it doesn't happen. Let's tell our technicians, tell myself, don't do that. Be careful of that. Have a look at it. Survey it. Okay. Um, yeah, farm, manure in bear and E. coli. Absolutely. E. coli one. Road infestations, leptospirosis, um, shelter, scabies. Yeah, scabies. That biohazard. That's a mite, isn't it? Um, I mean, we don't really deal with that in, in our industry anyway, but yeah, scabies, well, that'd be a biohazard. I think it would. But yeah, good point though, Nick. You know, still something to think about. Absolutely. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going now. I'm always talking, I'm doing. I'll go through a couple more. So domestic cat litter, cage pets, absolutely. You know, you'll, you'll do your risk assessments. You think about it, you do a risk assessment for a domestic property, you're doing a treatment for whatever you know a, a pesticide you're using possibly you'll be like oh have you got any cats or dogs i don't want to hurt them i don't want to put them at risk but what about you what about you being at risk um you know having to having to think about that um if you have a right to say look i'm not a big fan of cats or i'm not a big fan of dogs or i'm a bit worried about them they, they should put them away um something for you to think about uh, just a couple more anthrax blimey yeah uh, on farms yeah well i mean there are a lot obviously more serious things you know foot and mouth disease and um and things like that as well that haven't mentioned necessarily but generally if those things break out on farms they'll they'll they won't let you on <laughs> um so i hope they wouldn't anyway i mean obviously if you're unlucky enough to come in that period where they didn't quite know about it and it's there and come into contact possibly but that's about communicating with farmer and trying to avoid the areas with the, with the animals um, we shouldn't really be around them eh? but sometimes going from area to area you might cross through them so we need to think about that okay Great, guys. That was amazing. That worked better than I thought it would. I um, thought you'd all ignore me and, you know, uh, say, Natalie, I'm not doing your job for you. Um, so, yeah, great. Uh, domestic pet allergies. I've just seen uh, seen one pop up there. I didn't mention yet. Um, David, that was great. Yeah, pet allergies. Um, again, we're all, we're all different, aren't we? We've all got to, you know, consider that um, in terms of it. Okay. Um, I'm going to move through these. I am, I am spending a bit of time on, on, on here. I've only got 15 minutes left and I'm probably uh, five or six slides left, but it's just run through quickly. I've talked about risk assessments. Haven't I? I've mentioned um, what, you know, what we need to do with them, but um, just as a, a bit of a, a visual, like I mentioned at the beginning, and I'm using different words here, but you know, it basically means the same. 
um, you know, eliminates to stay away from the cows. You know, if we're talking about a farmyard, um, reducing them, you know, only go in the cow shed if absolutely necessary. You know, if you're thinking I've got to get over into that corner there or I've got to go from this side of the cow shed to get out that door so I can get to that area that I need to inspect, then, um, you know, and only do it if it's absolutely necessary. Um, even better, remove the cows from the, uh, uh, you know, where you got to go. Um, maybe, say, immunizations, training. Training is a good one. So, you know, that's a big part of the Health and Safety at Work Act as well, is that <clears throat> yourself and your staff and technicians are, are all aware of the hazards. They're, they're, they're trained, not just to technically get rid of a pest, but to also look after themselves while they're working for you. Um, and, and technicians, while you're working for somebody else, um, you know, if you think, actually, I don't really know much about this thing, I want to know more about it. You, you've got a legal right to request it. So training, you know, show them about the things to look out for, things to avoid, you know, risk assessment. If you do a risk assessment, talk to everyone about it. Just email it, you know, it's tempting to do, I know, but, you know, have a chat about it, have a Zoom call about it, other platforms available. Um, and then uh, PPE. So, yeah, wear cow proof gloves. You know, it's in a funny mood when I wrote that bit, but you know what I mean? Um, PPE, you know, obviously, you know, you're not going to have PPE against the cows. going to be a bit silly, um, but, you know, farmyard, you're going to make sure you've got maybe disposable overalls on that, you you know, you're not going to be using else. Because that's a big thing on farmyard, especially when we have outbreaks of certain biohazards. You know, you, you see all these um, investigators on the site kind of wearing these white suits and all zipped up and they always dispose of it afterwards because, you know, they can they can carry that that um that disease that virus that has broken out so you know maybe it's something to think about whether you do that or if you don't have the disposals disposable ones you feel that you know it's not necessary because again do you feel it's necessary to have disposable ones you might just think actually my standard overalls are fine we'll just make sure we wash them regularly or we have two or three pairs and after we've been on a farm we can wash them it really is up to you to decide how you're going to mitigate those rest those, those um those risks um and and again you know wasp nests if you're dealing with wasp nests you've got someone even if you they're not aware of any particular problems with wasp stings we still don't want people to get stung do we you know because you don't really know how they're going to react um so you know of course we're going to wear veils we're going to wear you know say <laughs> you know trousers but you know the wasps want to get you sometimes they do get you don't they but um you know sometimes i'll double up um just to protect but again thinking about these things what you can do eliminate reduce control and then ppe last resort um uh again not a risk assessment talk but just as a um an idea here the, so I, I mentioned earlier about the generic risk assessment you know look at the pest controller's role in a, a broad way and assess it you know what are the likely biohazards they're going to come across you know you, you can you can do it sort of blue sky thinking you can do it in a meeting room when you're all sat there you know sort of then, yeah, you know, I might come across these things and let's mitigate them. Um, and then maybe when you start a new contract or you start a new a new job and it's on a farm that you haven't been on before, you do your site specific stuff. So, right, what have they got here? Cattle, uh, sheep, both, none of them might be an arable farm. It might be crops and, and things like that where the animal thing is actually no longer an issue. It's now about maybe machinery. So again, biohazards are going to change and be different. Uh, you might have spores from the processes. Really is site-specific, you know, so make sure that's done. Um, and then dynamic. So dynamic risk assessment, we'll just use that as a, you know, it's something you do out and about all the time. I, you know, I do it when I get up from my desk and, you know, go and get a cup of coffee. I'm sort of looking out for dog toys I might fall over or, um, you know, not burning myself on the kettle and, and things like that. We all do that all the time. And also we do it in our work. So when we're out there and we're, you know, going into, we've done a site specific risk assessment for uh, Natalie's farm. Um, but, you know, each time I go, going to do a bit of a dynamic look around has anything changed oh actually I mean that's popped up over there I wasn't I didn't know that was there before and you, you might then go and change your site specific one so dynamic all right be dynamic um but yeah the key really is to uh, you know talk to everyone consult ask all what's talk don't sit there don't let some one person do it and kind of drive himself crazy let's have a chat about it um yeah, again, I've sort of mentioned this. So mitigating the risk, you know, these are things to think about. So do, you know, do my employees or do you as a technician work within or around animals or insects? Um, 
hazardous pathogens, materials such as sewerage. You know, we've mentioned all these things, haven't we? Sharps, you know, is the training inadequate? Um, what training could you have? Oh, this is part of it, isn't it? This webinar is part of the training I'm talking about. So, you know, you get your CPD points for it. It'll be on your CPD record. Um, this is this is part of it. This is part of your risk assessing. This is your due diligence as a company owner, as a technician to go, right, I know a bit more about, you know, biohazards. Great. Um, you know, do they have the proper protective equipment? So again, it's not just about having it and providing it. Make sure everybody knows how they should be using it or when they should be using it. You know, make sure you regularly ask the question, have you run out of anything? Do you need anything renewing? Is anything ripped or broken that, you know, um, is, is needed? Um, record these things as well. Because if you're doing it, record it. Remember, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. Um, and then, you know, is the workplace clean of mold and fungi and stuff? And that's more, you know, rather than your, your workplace um, or when you're out and about, if, you, if you're going across properties that have been standing for a long time and have got some particular structural issues. Um, again, this is part of the article in the magazine that I talked about in PPC 101. Um, you know, I've, again, I've, I've spoken about a lot of this, but you've got the mitigation uh, or mitigating the risks, um, common routes. So again, ingestion, inhalation, skin, mucin, these are all the ways that it can enter the body. <clears throat> um, so again, you know, avoiding things like, you know, drinking and eating and smoking and nail biting, um, and, unless you sort of, you know, wash your hands properly, don't eat anything, um, you know, straight after being on a site that might be, you know, a farm, for example, you know, go and make sure you've washed, washed down properly and washed your hands. And, you know, it's just up to the employer to provide the um, employee with with hand wash, you know, so that, that comes up a lot. And you think, well, if they're in a van, lone working, how can I give them hand wash? Well, you need to figure out if, if you've got employees that are going on to farms and things that may be hazardous or, or anywhere, you know, I'll put the lists on there. Anywhere can be hazardous. You've got to provide them with hand wash. Think about it. Whether, however you want to do it, it might be wipes, it might be, you know, running water, it might be you have agreements with um, your customers. Um, OK, I'm not going to go through all of these. By all means, if anybody wanted to, you know, I haven't spent much time on this slide, but if you want to have a little nose, uh, um, a nose addict, give us an email. I'm sure I'd be happy just to send you this, this slide over and you can have a good look at it. OK, um, so to sum up, really, before we go on to some questions, um, be aware of the biohazards that affect your business. You know, blue sky thinking, right? What does it do as well as site specific stuff? Um, risk assess it, talk, discuss and consult and, you know, be safe, people. That's that's the key, isn't it? Um, stay away from it if you can. If you can't protect yourself. That's the key, really. Quite straightforward. Just before we go into questions, just a quick reminder to anybody um, that, that is, is, you know, up for helping out Prostate Cancer UK and supporting our, our charity. We're all doing 11,000 steps a month. I've only done 3,681 today, so I'm going to be wandering up to the shops, I think, later on to try and get my steps up. So, yeah, a lot of us at BBC are doing that for the whole of March, uh, March, March the March, March, March. Yeah, um, 11,000 steps a day. It's been tricky. And I've I've committed that any day that I miss, I'm going to donate £10 for each day I miss. I've missed three. But hey, prostate cancer are benefiting, aren't they? Because I'm going to donate an extra 30 quid minimum. No more, all right? I'm going to do my steps. Okay, fab. So questions. Let me stop sharing the screen. Um, where are we going? There we are. I've got two questions there. I must have just like so thoroughly covered everything that you wanted to know that you didn't have too many questions. Great. And also I've only got seven minutes left, so um, not a bad thing, but get them in, still get them in. If you, if you think, oh, Natalie hasn't got time to answer these questions, still put the question up. Cause what I'll do is we will pull those questions off afterwards and I will type up some answers to them and pop them out in an email to everybody. So you've got them. Okay. Uh, so Balint, would it matter now if I had flu-like symptoms in the past after working with the rat urine and pigeon guano, let's say two or three years ago, would it affect my health now, even after I recovered from it? I have no idea. Uh, apologies about that, Balint. It, you know, I'm not a medical professional, whether or not it would stay within your system. I'm sure there will be um, some that could. So we have, I haven't got one with me. We've got a, for, for members, you can get a lepto 
spruce this um, sort of warning card, if you like, and carry around with you. And it's something you can give medical professionals and say, look, you know, I work in this industry. I'm at risk from these. I think we mentioned some other um, possible infections or diseases on there. Um, and you can show that to your medical, you know, to your GP, and then they can do the relevant tests. Um, but speak to them, speak to them about it. If you're concerned about anything, um, then, then yeah, speak, speak to your GP. I wouldn't like to direct you in the wrong, wrong way for that balance. Uh, so, Christian, how much risk is there of those airborne diseases being contracted through the eyes when goggles steam up, for example, they usually get removed? So, yeah, the, the mucous membranes, um, that slide that I didn't have too much time to spend on, is certainly contraction. So if you're if you're working, you might, you might have your, your gloves on, um, you know, you might get an itchy eye and go, oh, 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 like that. That's bad because, yeah, you can absolutely... Um, uh, contract diseases and, and 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 suffer from bacteria through um, through your eye membrane. Um, so yeah, with goggles steaming up, um, I mean no, if they're secure, because goggles need to, you know, PPE is all going to be effective and uh, um, uh, in working order. So you know, if you've got goggles that are protecting you from small particles like dust, and they're slightly sitting off of your face, you know, maybe around the side here on the tops. Then they're not effective. They're not they're not protecting you properly. So that that's the first problem. You, know, you get dust in there or spores in there that could then go into your membrane. So, um, but you saying about the goggles steaming up? That's when they're tight to your face. So you've got a nice seal, and you, you know nothing's getting in there. Um, again, it's you know as long as uh, when you take them off straight away, you wash them. Because again, this is all about PPE management and PPE maintenance. Again, another subject. Um, we, you know, we have checklists for our members that we can we can share with you in terms of, you know, checking PPE and what we recommend. And um, but you know, that's one of them, making sure they're clean. Um, and you know, after every use, give them a wipe down. Certainly, if you're in a dusty environment, I think that's what the question was, Christian. Um, but yeah, absolutely through your eyes. That is, a uh, you know, eyes and cuts and uh, you know through your mouth, uh, eating, and all these things um, can happen. Okay, Nigel, why will BBCA provide a code of best practice to cover this? Do you want to help me write it? Um, why do we have one? Biological hazards? No. We, no, to put it short. So we are, we're working at creating some more health and safety stuff um, and probably, you know, mitigating risks and general risks uh, in the industry that might be covered within it. But it's something to think about, Nigel. Yeah, we can have a chat about it another time and remind me of that idea. And yeah, we can we can speak to the committees and boards and see if that's something we, we want to do. Um, good question. Uh, uh, but like, no worries I feel all right so it should be fine ha uh ha -huh. I hope you are fine blimey yeah um sorry I didn't um maybe was expecting more from me today you know people always expect so much always here I thought hopefully you get what you're paid for but we'll um yeah go and have a chat to your GP hope you feel fine but if you're worried about anything, go and, go and chat to them. Uh, so, Luke, please, can you provide a leptospirosis card PDF? I have no idea, Luke. Um, we've got a whole batch of them in the office, which we can send out to members. So if you, you email me and you say, oh, Natalie, I, I want some those lepto cards you were chatting about, I'll then give it to someone else um, to do. No, I, will, we'll, I think they're in the office. So, you know, some people go in intermittently to do some bits. So um, I can send it over and they can pop some out in the post to you. Uh, PDF? No. I'm, I mean, they're, they're cards, you know, they're like, they're, they're like, um, you know, laminated cards like this that you can get um, put in your wallet or your purse to carry around with you. And if you, you know, do need it, you can show show your GP. But yeah, PDF, I don't think we do. No, but give me an email. I'll have, we'll have, a, have a look into it. Uh, David, what what does a yearly blood test you mentioned check for apart from Neto? Oh, David, I knew you'd ask me that. I can't remember. Very long, complicated words. I can't remember. This was probably eight, mm, 16 years ago, maybe. Um, and, you know, the company took it upon themselves to have this uh, health surveillance in place. So that's what it was. It was health surveillance 
um, once a year uh, with the agreements of, of the technician, of course, you know, and I, I didn't have a problem with it, but, um, you know, it wasn't something they enforced on everybody, but encouraged, certainly. Um, and they, they were tested for different things. I can't remember different infections. Um, so apologies about that. But you can, again, speak to your GPs. They will be able to guide you on it because they've got they got the relevant knowledge um, in terms of you tell them what you might come into contact with and they'll be able to tell you what tests that you can have. Um, so, yeah, I would ask, I would I would say, you know, I'll go and ask the company you work for, but they don't really exist anymore. So, uh, OK. Um, I don't remember any of these questions today. I'm quite disappointed in myself. Um, so, Michelle, how do we get one of those virus disease cards? I just mentioned about that. Great. Get, just give us an email, Michelle, and we'll um, pop, it, pop you out some in the post. And, uh, yeah, bish, bash, bosh. Uh, I should finish now, really. Let's see. No, let me just see. Um, is there any specific industry advice for potentially imported hazardous animals, e.g. spiders, scorpions, etc., which may present risks? That's from William. So, yeah, um, not so much imported. No, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got relevant organisations. DEFRA will deal with that sometimes or RSPCA. Sometimes if it's a snake or a spider, they might help you out. There's different organisations. But in terms of BPCA, um, we don't really. No, there's, there's no specific industry advice. But again, you know, I don't want to keep this very BPCA. And if you're a BPCA member, give us a call and have a chat about it. But that's what it is. Um, and, you know, but I mean, even if you're not a member, give us a call and I'll you know, maybe direct you somewhere that, that, that can help you. Um, but if there's a specific incident, we've helped out with those before. You know, people have said they've found different spiders in bananas that have come in, for example. And, you know, we've managed to direct them somewhere. So, yeah, sort of case by case, really depends what it is. But we, we don't hold any any information for that. Um, uh, Luke, so sorry, mean a scan by email. Tell you what, give me an email. Go on the website. You'll find my email on there. I'm not sure what 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 it is you want. So just give me an email direct. Uh, be easier. Um, okay, last one. I'm a bit over, but hey, if you're all happy, last question. So when applying uh, cypermethrin 24%, would a full face mask with A2, P2 canister filter be all right to use? Um, so, I mean, it's not necessarily a, a biohazard. However, happy to answer it. Um, read the label in the MSDS sheet. Ta -da! Um, whatever it says on there. So your, the PPE will be um, in terms of protection. The safety data sheet will certainly mention it. The label will, will say what you should be wearing or shouldn't be wearing. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, whether it's a particle filter or a gas filter, have a look on that safety data sheet. That's the best place. I'm not going to answer that for you because, you know, safety data sheets can change, advice can change. I don't know that. I mean, give me the trade name there. I didn't read it out because I don't like to read out trade names. But yeah, cypermethrin, um, depending on the formulation, the droplet size, all these things will depend on, on what uh, what you had. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot off, guys. I'm gonna let you shoot off as well. Really, really appreciate. Like I said in the beginning, motivated people out there. Fantastic. Thank you. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you for the next one. Okay, see you guys. Bye.